Good afternoon and welcome to the America Floor Endowment Pro Pro webinar series. I'm your moderator, Lena Layton, and I'm a member of AFE Young Professional Council, and I recently graduated with a PhD in plant breeding genomics and genetics from the University of Georgia. Today's session is on the control and management of powdery mildews. On behalf of the endowment, I'm excited to be part of AFE Grow Pro's webinar series that features a new topic every month presented by an industry expert. The webinars are free to everyone, thanks to the general support of AFE sponsors. This session is sponsored by BASF, BioWorks, OHP, and Syngenta. BASF is a multinational company that creates chemistry for a sustainable future with environmental protection and social responsibility. BioWorks helps the horticulture and especially agriculture markets successfully develop crops to market with biological based solutions and support. OHP is a leading provider of technology based pesticide solutions for the greenhouse and nursery production markets. And Syngenta is a, leader science, is a leading science based ag tech company who helps millions of farmers around the world grow safe and nutritious food while taking care of the planet. If you'd like to, like to, like, if you'd like to learn more about our sponsors, or if you're a supplier and interested in becoming a sponsor for a topic, you can find the information on AFE website, endowment.org slash GrowPro, or click the link in the chat. Today's session was pre-recorded in English for Marjorie Daudry. After the presentation, we will have time for a Q&A. We encourage you to please submit your questions through the Q&A feature or the chat at any time. We'll answer as many of your questions live as we can before the end of the hour. Any unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange following the presentation. This session is being recorded and will be shared to AFE YouTube channel. Through YouTube's accessibility features, you will be able to access closed captions and other languages. Without further ado, I'd like to present today's expert speaker, Marjorie Dutcher. Marjorie Doucher is a senior extension associate with the section of plant pathology and plant microbiology of Cornell University. She has conducted a research and extension program on the management of, disease, of diseases of ornamental plants since 1978 at Cornell's Long Island or Horticultural Research and Extension Center in Riverhead, New York. She educates growers on management of greenhouse and nursery crops diseases runs a diagnostic laboratory and investigates controls for boxwood blight in patients down in mildew and other terrible diseases. Dattori holds a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the College of William and Mary and a, and a Master of Science in Plant Pathology from the University of Massachusetts. She's a co-author of several books, including the recent, the recent compendium of bedding plant diseases and pests. Marjorie, welcome and thank you for presenting today on the control and management of powdery mildews. Hello, I'm Marjorie Daughtry from Cornell University, and I am going to have the pleasure of speaking with you today about powdery mildews, one of the most obvious, but one of the most tricky diseases in the greenhouse that we're trying to manage. There are a lovely long list of plants that can get powdery mildew. I've just put some of our favorites here. These are the crops where if you've grown them, you probably know they can have a powdery mildew problem. Uh, there are begonias and calabrocoas and gerberas and hydrangeas. Um, all of these have similar looking powdery mildews, but they're not the same ones. They're different fungi that look alike. Um, also petunias, roses, rosemary, terrenia, verbenas and African violets. And then a whole host of perennial plants are prone to powdery mildew. We don't always see them in the greenhouse phases of production, but by the end of the, the season, you probably will. Uh, things like sedum and monarda and phlox and helianthemum. Um, then there are also a number of edible crops um, that might be involved in powdery mildew outbreaks. Uh, things such as hemp and tomato and cucumber and pumpkin and squash and lettuce. So lots of our most important crops can be on the how to control powdery mildew list. One of the most impressive things is to see powdery mildew showing up on a red leaf lettuce. Um, this really helps you to visualize it. We're lucky that most of our crops are green instead of red because the contrast isn't so great. Um, it can be really tricky to grow lettuce crops if they are prone to powdery mildew 
um, under northeastern conditions because there's a lot of humidity provided by the uh, cultivation system if you have them as a hydroponic crop, for example. Sometimes also with lettuce, your powdery mildew may not be easy to recognize. And that's one of the things I want to stress today is that you can be fooled by powdery mildew sometimes because it doesn't always have the classic look. Um, in this instance, you have areas that look collapsed, they look bruised. You might imagine it's a bacterial disease or something like that. Uh, but in reality, you're looking at a powdery mildew problem on these lettuce leaves. If you need to determine if something is a powdery mildew, it helps to have at least a magnifying glass, if not a dissecting microscope, because you can take areas that you suspect of possibly being powdery mildew because you know the plant is susceptible and look at them very closely uh, at magnification. And you can usually see the hyphae, the strands of the fungus growing across the surface of the leaf, as you see here, and also perhaps make out some of the spores, uh, which are sort of barrel shaped. Um, elongate ovals. When you look at the spores um, in real life with some magnification, you can see that there are chains of these barrel-shaped clear spores um, that uh, tower above the leaf. This would be something like an ant's view of what a powdery mildew looks like. Um, there are um, chains of spores usually with the ones at the tip being the most mature. So they're the ones that are going to be picked up by air currents and moved to new plants within the greenhouse. Uh, this is why with powdery mildew, you can get such rapid buildup of an epidemic uh, or an epiphytotic, if you want to use the fancy term for a plant version of an epidemic, uh, because the spores are produced in huge numbers and they can be easily moved just by air currents. And as you go to control a powdery mildew, never think that you should stop the air to stop the movement because air movement is the only way we can pull the humidity away from the leaf surface. And it's actually in the long run, much better for the crop to have good air movement than poor air movement. Even though it might help circulate the spores, it's essential to keep the plant surface at a lower humidity so that you have less of a problem with the disease. Here's some typical colonies of powdery mildew on Zinnia. Uh, up at the top, you can see there's some there which are very grainy looking. That's the way they will appear when the powdery mildew is making the spores, which are called conidia. It'll become sort of sugary looking when there's an accumulation of spores. Um, if you look down at the base of the leaf, you'll see areas that are more just cloudy. Those would be places where if you used a hand lens, you could see that there were fibers of the fungus growing across the surface of the leaf. These are putting down little hostoria, little um, absorptive structures and pulling nutrients from the epidermal cells so that you've got the <clears throat> powdery mildew fungus acting as a parasite of the plant. The unfortunate thing is that we grow ornamental plants and um, powdery mildew is really easy to see. And it also doesn't think that it should only make colonies on leaves. So you're going to see these growths of the fungus on the leaves as well as on stems, pedicels, on bracts even. So virtually all your above ground parts of the plant, even petals, can be involved in a powdery mildew uh, expression of, of symptoms because it's just a very visible fungus that's growing on the surface and pulling its food from the plant. Um, you will see a difference as you go from plant to plant and as you go from one set of conditions to another in terms of what the powdery mildew is going to look like. And again, there are many different fungi that cause the disease. So each one of the fungi might have a slightly different look. Some produce a thicker white coating on the plant, some produce a thinner coating. So you'll see some variability, but usually you'll be able to connect to what you know about powdery mildew and recognize one for what it is with just a little bit of magnification. So what's the difference between the powdery mildews and the downy mildews? Um, they sound a lot alike, but these are common names and common names can be very deceiving. So I would like to make the point to you that you should think of these two things as very different kinds of diseases. They're nothing alike really, other than the fact they have the word mildew in their name. Uh, here's a set of contrasts that might help you. Uh, with the powdery mildew, it is a true fungus that's causing the disease. The pathogens are all fungi. With the downy mildews, the pathogens are oomycetes, or an easier term to remember might be water molds. Um, there is a spread in both cases that can involve wind uh, more easily, perhaps, with the powdery mildew. 
with downy mildews, there's a lot more involvement of splashing or wind-driven rain because it does much better in a wet system. In the case of powdery mildew, it only takes high humidity to favor the disease, whereas in the case of downy mildew, there's need for actual free moisture in quantity to favor the disease and the infection process. Powdery mildew is usually on the top of the leaf and downy mildew is usually on the bottom of the leaf. And that's the textbook information that could fool you because after watching powdery mildew for many years, I've learned that it often starts on the bottom of the leaf and later on when conditions are perfect for it, it will move to the surface of the leaf where it's easier for you to notice it. So it's always a good idea when you know you're growing a very powdery mildew prone crop to periodically turn over some leaves and make sure you don't see some powdery mildew starting to fester on the underside. It's just more humid down there. It's an easier place for the powdery mildew to get started. Um, there's also a difference in terms of how systemic these diseases are. Powdery mildew for the most part is um, really just where you see it. It's a, not a systemic disease. Um, the downy mildews in contrast can be extremely systemic. So that has something to do with how hard they are to control and what you might use to control them. In both cases, you've got diseases that produce epidemics. You've got um, diseases where uh, resistance is ideal. You would like to be growing crops that aren't susceptible to the problem. And you're also talking about pathogens where um, because they produce such huge numbers of spores, you have a very high likelihood that a mutation can develop uh, into a very resistant population of pathogen, meaning that if you were to make the mistake of using the same fungicide over and over again, uh, both a powdery mildew and a downy mildew can become resistant pretty quickly. And the thing that they share this with is botrytis. That's the third disease that's so easily able to become resistant to whatever fungicide you might be using, if indeed it only has one mechanism for hurting the fungus. Um, this is why we like to use some products that have multiple targets within the fungus that we're trying to control. They're just safer in terms of resistance development to the chemistry that we might want to use. So going along with what I just said, hopefully you would all jump to a conclusion that this is a powdery mildew and you would be right um, because this is a white coating on the upper surface of the leaf. Most of the time when you see a powdery mildew, uh, you're going to see either individual colonies or coatings of white on upper surfaces of the foliage tissue. So let's start out with the uh, crop, which happens to be the, the current one at the time we're making this recording. Um, this is poinsettia and look how beautiful its powdery mildew is. It's really striking. We've made a lot of bad jokes about how it could be um, charged for as extra flocking on the plants. Uh, we do have folks spraying poinsettias to create effects. Well, this effect is coming from the fungus that's attacking the plant. Um, it's a disease that does well under home humidities or uh, dis in display areas in public buildings. So you can't think of it as something that will quit happening after it leaves the greenhouse. It just gets worse. So the greenhouse industry needs to control it at the source and not let it get out into the world or it will make customers very unhappy. Um, here you can see two sizes of colony, which I think is interesting. The larger ones happened at some point in time. And then when they became mature and produced spores themselves, those spores were distributed by air currents and started those new colonies that are tinier there, uh, which are probably several weeks younger than the first set of spots were. Um, this is the unfortunate truth with this disease is it will just keep getting worse and worse on the plant tissue over time. And you need to notice it quickly so you can stop that process. The worst thing that the poinsettia um, version of powdery mildew does is that it actually goes after the bracts as well. Uh, from the fungus's point of view, um, a bract is just a modified leaf and it's perfectly happy to take its nutrition from the bracts as well as from the leaves. So again, the point that you need to keep in mind is that you absolutely need to get control of the disease before you get to bract formation because it does make the crop completely unsaleable. As you're growing during the summer, when you see any yellowing on a poinsettia leaf, it's wise to take that leaf and turn it over and check the back of it because you have to go through some questions in your mind about what it might be. Um, there could be spider mites feeding on the underside. There might be a spray injury. 
there might be a cercospor leaf spot or some other uh, fungal leaf spot, or perhaps uh, just a low light situation, you need to find out whether it's powdery mildew. And in this case, if you have a really keen eye, you can probably make out some very faint powdery mildew colonies, even on the upper surface of the leaf. But it can be easily mistaken for some sort of nutritional deficiency. Looking at the undersurface of the leaf, it's a lot more obvious that what you're seeing there is powdery mildew. And this is a very common appearance for poinsettias during the summer. Um, here it's only in the latter part of October that the conditions are such that powdery mildew starts showing up on the upper surface of the leaves. So noticing the problem when it's at this stage hiding under the leaves is really helpful for your control. Um, that combination of yellowing above, white colonies below lets you know that you're fighting with powdery mildew. The um, conidia, the little spores that we were looking at earlier are not the only part of this organism's life cycle. There is also something which you probably won't see in the greenhouse that is a uh, sexual spore stage that powdery mildews can do. On this leaf, if you look at the lower left, you can see some little black specks those are structures known as chasmothesia, which used to be called pleistothesia. And they are the spore cases for the spores that help this fungus to overwinter under natural conditions. In the greenhouse, we don't need to overwinter the powdery mildew, except just letting it make spores and more spores and go from one leaf to another. Um, so the fungus doesn't usually go into the mode of forming chasmothesia. Um, but there are always exceptions to these kinds of things. Here's a close up of one of those structures. This is an, an ascus coming out of an, a uh, chasmothesium. And that little ascus, that um, little um, circular blob there, has eight ascospores starting to form inside of it. And those would ordinarily be released in the spring of the year uh, from a dead leaf that might have fallen to the ground. This particular one is on Podosphera afanis which happens to be the strawberry powdery mildew. And uh, I mentioned there are always exceptions. Well, this is an exception in that you will see these chasmothesia, these little black specks uh, at the base of the fruit uh, here on the pedestal. And um, they are going to be able to produce, sexually produce spores inside there uh, that would probably be released in the greenhouse and uh, add to the versatility of the fungus. It makes it easier for it to become resistant to pesticides, for example, to have a sexual reproduction process. Um, you can tell this is a strawberry, hopefully, because you can see a few of the freckles over here. Um, this was a disease that I wasn't familiar with until last year uh, when I learned that powdery mildew in the case of greenhouse-grown strawberries uh, can cause funny little fuzzy white seeds um, to form on the outside of the fruit, the achenes there. Uh, so this is a difficult disease to control because the high humidity of the greenhouse makes it easy for this powdery mildew to thrive. When you're trying to identify the different powdery mildews, you will ordinarily see the white colonies, but there are going to be times when you will have different looks on the tissue. And I want to give you some examples of that that you can learn from. Um, here is yellowing on foliage. This is a, a tree actually, it's a magnolia, and there is powdery mildew that is very obvious on the underside of the leaf but you can't tell that it's a powdery mildew from the upper surface of the leaf. Here's a case of dahlia, uh, which was sent to me by a grower who was not familiar with cut flower production yet. And they didn't know what was happening because the powdery mildew in this case was very faint. It's not necessarily a bright white. It can be just a very thin growth on the tissue, which is why hand lens can help you to visualize it. Sometimes you have sparse growth so that you don't see white colonies but you will also see a tissue reaction to the presence of the powdery mildew. And that can be a, a bright red, as you see here on this hydrangea, that's very typical with hydrangeas to redden from powdery mildew. In this case, there's probably a thin growth on the upper surface of the leaf, as well as maybe a thicker growth of powdery mildew on the undersurface of the leaf. You're looking at the defense responses of the leaf to the powdery mildew, which is feeding on it. So the plant's responding uh, to that foreign influence. Here's a little bit more look at hydrangea. Here you can see that the bracts will respond also with pigment. In many cases, the pigments um, are part of the defense process of the plant. And so you're looking at the plant defending itself when you see these reddish or purple areas 
on hydrangea leaves. And the same sort of thing can happen with some of your other crops as well. Sometimes the powdery mildew on a leaf can look like it's a paint job. Here you see it just running along the veins, which is sort of an unusual pattern. Um, here you can see a greasy look. This is one of the, the looks that you might want to learn if you're going to grow begonias, uh, because that greasy look actually under magnification would show you some hyphae growing across the surface of the leaf. And you could tell it was powdery mildew, which might look very white and fluffy on other cultivars of begonia nearby. Some of the other plants that can show a greasy type of spot uh, include sedum and some of the other crassulaceous plants. You have um, areas here that are colony shaped, but they're on the underside and they have that water soaked look, which we're normally associating with things like bacteria. So it could fool you. Here's another um, close up of sedum looking very scabby um, because that tissue is injured. It can get very rough and brown and not really look very white at all. And here's a calancho, similar um, type of plant also will show in some instances scabby spots rather than little fluffy white round spots. Sometimes the powdery mildew tries to fool us by commingling with other diseases. Here you've got a monarda leaf that has rust on the undersurface, uh, little rust pustules that are sort of orangey tan and also some powdery mildew colonies. Ordinarily on Monarda, it's very easy to tell you have powdery mildew because there's lots of it. It's one of the very susceptible perennials. One of the trickiest things to recognize might be flower symptoms from powdery mildew. You might mistake this look for thrips feeding effects, for example, but that's really from powdery mildew infections on white petals. You can get these tan stripes. Um, and the way to identify it would be to look around at the foliage and realize that there is powdery mildew affecting the foliage at the same time. And then you can put two and two together and realize that um, the flowers are being affected by uh, that which is messing up the foliage as well. Sometimes you'll see the powdery mildew hiding um, underneath the petals. Um, Gerber is one, again, one of the more susceptible crops. So you should be watching your Gerber crops for the beginnings of powdery mildew problems at all times. Uh, sometimes there is thrips feeding injury, so don't get fooled by that. As the thrips feed, they can cause distortions, but sometimes the coloring of the petal tissue is uh, changed by the thrips feeding. So little white flecks on petals might mean thrips, and that's another important thing to identify in the greenhouse. So check, knock the, the plant against a sheet of white paper, see if thrips go running out. Uh, here's a heliopsis, a perennial, showing you um, some colonies that are... Um, a little bit whitish here on some of the petals, but there's also just sort of brown bruised areas caused by powdery mildew infection as well. And then peony is an example of a plant that can show just a thin coating of powdery mildew rather than necessarily uh, the pretty little white colonies that, that we know from many of our other crops. And sometimes in the case of the peony, the powdery mildew is going to be able to go right to the stems and cause a thick coating there as well. This is because of the shading of the plant, there's a very humid area there. And again, all those above ground tissues are susceptible to powdery mildew. Roses, one of the classic uh, plants to get powdery mildew problems, uh, especially under greenhouse conditions where we have the high humidity. There can be infection of everything, including the flower petals, which is of course the worst possibility. The powdery mildew that affects rose is prone to go to the pedicels, the, the stems that hold the flowers. So it tends to go first to the part of the plant that everyone's going to be looking at later on when you have a bouquet. So you need very quick and actually a great protectant program to keep powdery mildew from starting on rose crops in the greenhouse and very prompt response to any awareness of, of an infection, whether you're talking miniature roses or hybrid teas. Um, the foliage is also affected. This particular powdery mildew fungus likes to go for new growth as well. So you'll see the new leaves being infected first and they will be pale and they will be a little distorted because of the powdery mildew infection. Uh, there can also be some strange looks on the foliage at times. These very dark red areas are from um, infections by powdery mildew, but probably as the leaf was starting to get a little older, so the plant's fighting back and that's why you see the red pigment. Another common powdery mildew that uh, we've dealt with over the past few decades is the one that affects verbenas. Uh, 
there are actually several that can go after verbena, but the one we've had the most trouble with is Podospira xanthii. And it can do a series of things to verbena that are hard to identify. So I wanted to take you through those. Um, you can see some yellowing at times. So a lot of folks have added fertilizer in response to powdery mildew because they didn't realize that there were also leaves that were covered with white that uh, were a clue to the fact that it was all about powdery mildew. Um, there can also be more purpling of lesions. I'm, I chose to photograph ones where you could see the mildew was there, but sometimes you'll just see the purple spot and you have to be a little bit psychic to realize that's a powdery mildew problem. Often this is all happening on the lower foliage of verbenas also, um, which is sometimes in a basket that's already hanging and it's happening down underneath the pot rim. So you need to sort of take them down and look at them once in a while and make sure everything's okay in that area near the soil. The other result of powdery mildew on these verbenas is often just death of leaves. So be suspicious of death of leaves and look nearby to see if there are any leaves that have a little powdery mildew on them. Often it's not all of the verbenas you're growing that have the problem. There's a huge variation in response from one cultivar to the next. So if you can get rid of a cultivar that's really prone or plants that have succumbed to it, um, then you can make life a lot safer for the others that might have less of a sensitivity. You can see a lot of variation even within a particular series of plants. Here you can see one lanai at the left that has absolutely no powdery mildew grown in the same experiment with uh, the lanai peach improved, uh, which has very conspicuous white spots. So as you purchase plants, you may need to be really specific about which ones you're growing. If you've learned that one is very prone to powdery mildew, it's best not to try to grow that one. We've done some trials over the years looking at the variation in cultivars um, in sensitivity to the Podosphera. And uh, we found some that are really highly resistant. And you've got a long list there, uh, Firehouse Lavender, Lanai Deep Purple, Superbina Violet Ice, Stormburst, Large Lilac Blue. I won't read them all to you, but there's some that just perform beautifully. And then in contrast, in the same trial, we'll see some that really uh, are quite good hosts for the powdery mildew. In this particular 2018 trial, for example, the Empress Imperial Blue, the Alaska Dark Violet 15, and the Lanai Blue Denim were really prone to powdery mildew. And then in these kinds of experiments, we'll also find that sometimes there are some plants that are susceptible, but at a much lower level. So there will just be a few colonies and it won't be as aggressive and it would be a lot easier to control with the fungicide um, or a fungicide plus biological program. Um, the ones in this category include the Firehouse Velvet, the Empress Violet Blue, the Superbina Purple and Dark Blue, and the Endurascape Blue Improved. There are some crops that only get powdery mildew very rarely. Uh, one of these is Petunia. I actually find I have to get particular cultivars if I want to do a trial on Petunia powdery mildew, but those that are prone to it get it very badly. Um, it's also often tricky to identify that that's happening. It's also the Podosphera xanthii, and it behaves very much like the disease on verbenas. You can see sometimes what looks like nutritional deficiency when you look quickly and think the plant needs nitrogen, when in reality there's a thin coating of powdery mildew across it, and what you really need is to get control of the powdery mildew. And sometimes you'll find powdery mildew on a new crop. Stay open to that. I started out by telling you there's certain crops that are prone to it. Those are the ones where you should always be thinking about uh, whether powdery mildew is starting up in the crop. Um, this is a crop that I just met this year, uh, String of Hearts. And the day I met it was the day I met the powdery mildew on the plant. Um, this is not just a bad case of needing to dust the plant. This is powdery mildew growing on the foliage. If you have a major crop, there's much more chance that there's going to be a plant breeding program that's going to bring you resistant plants to grow in the near future. Uh, with things like the foliage plants, it may take a little longer before the system finds ones that are not so prone to a, a disease such as powdery mildew. Rosemary is one of the crops that's always been prone to powdery mildew and it can be really hard for growers who are producing it in a highly humid environment. Um, we've tested some of the products on rosemary to see how well they would do against uh, a powdery mildew epidemic, working with some of the gentler materials that can be used on an edible crop, such as millstop and cease and horticultural spray oils, um, to see if we can really successfully suppress the disease. 
And the good news is that yes, you can. Uh, these things do work, but you're talking usually a one week spray interval, nothing that would last very long. So you have to work at control if you have a powdery mildew outbreak. Uh, here's the data from this one trial. The first bar there is showing you um, about 45% of the foliage covered with powdery mildew in the untreated controls. Uh, the third bar there is uh, treatment with CEASE, a biological control, which has reduced the disease by more than half, but it hasn't reduced it to zero. In between, there's a bar that's not very tall at all, which is showing you Milstop, which has had very strong control of the disease. And after the, the CEASE bar, there's one for ultra-fine oil, which was used at the time. You'd probably use a SUF oil today. And it's a very, very low bar, which is a good sign. After that, we had different rotations that we were trying uh, using the mill stop and then the cease or using the oil and then the mill stop and then the cease. Um, and basically of those, the most successful that we tried was to start with oil and then go to mill stop and keep alternating those through the course of the trial. Um, all of these are good products for working with crops where it's an edible and you're really limited in your choice of fungicidal controls. Another aspect that we may be going into more in future is working with the nutrition of the plants to try to make them less susceptible to powdery mildew. And the classic example here are the cucurbits, things like cucumbers grown in greenhouses. Um, there's been some very successful reduction of powdery mildew in cucurbit crops by increasing silicon within the plant. And um, those who are silicon researchers are big believers in the fact that um, it might be more effective than we realize and might be something that is well worth studying in other kinds of plants that aren't necessarily famous accumulators of silicon. So we'll, we'll look for improvements in that area too. Hopefully we'll be able to manipulate um, internal ingredients of the plant's nutrition to get some control of the disease that will help reduce our pesticide use. Um, here's an illustration of powdery mildew on squash, which happens to be the same powdery mildew that goes to verbena. Uh, here's the host range of this particular one. This is the Podosphera xanthii. It does go to petunias and verbenas in particular. Uh, it also goes to some shrubs like the budlia. It goes to some crops that are sometimes weeds like Biden's, um, but it's a fairly short list, but it's really um, important to realize that if you're trying to grow zucchini in the same greenhouse, or you're growing verbena, they might be sharing a powdery mildew. In many cases, plants are going to be having totally different powdery mildew susceptibilities because there's a lot of host specificity built into the growth of a powdery mildew fungus on its host in most instances. But this is one where, gee, we might be growing more than one of the hosts within uh, a greenhouse. Uh, this works for me because the other plant pathologist here at the Long Island Horticultural Research and Extension Center uh, studies the cucurbit pathogens and we can share a greenhouse and share inoculum and run two trials in the same greenhouse at the same time. Tomatoes are also prone to powdery mildew. There's one called Oidium neolycopersicae, uh, which is quite common under greenhouse humidity situations. And it's given us some very interesting information about the environmental control of this particular disease. And I need to stress that probably the temperatures and the humidity levels would be a little bit different for every one of the other powdery mildews you might need to control. But this is an interesting example to help you understand how powdery mildews operate. Uh, by studying this one very carefully, uh, they learned that it was temperatures between 59 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit that really favored the disease. If it was hotter, it was not going to be as much of a problem. Uh, they also learned that the relative humidity between 60 and 90% was ideal for favoring the infection. If it got higher, it would actually reduce the powdery mildew. And that's probably because there are a lot of fungi such as Amphalomyces that are parasites of the parasite. When you get wet enough conditions, the powdery mildews themselves crash. And you can see this happening outdoors in some years when we have rainier weather, we'll have less powdery mildew problems. And then a cultural control that might come into play in your greenhouse is in this instance, they have found that higher nitrogen increases the powdery mildew disease in the tomatoes. So by just a slight reduction of nitrogen, you can make your job easier when you're trying to control a powdery mildew. If you're growing perennials, it's really important to produce ones that are not highly prone to powdery mildew because even if you don't have a problem with them, uh, the customers ultimately will have a problem in their gardens 
Uh, the ones that we've seen less trouble with here include David and Orange Perfection and Prime Minister, uh, Starfire, Blue Boy, Miss Ellie, Miss Universe, Laura, and Nikki. And there's also a great set of data from the Chicago Botanic Gardens research uh, that Richard Hawkey put together that's available uh, for not just flocks. There's also been studies of Monarda and you can learn about their experience over several seasons and what level of powdery mildew was seen with the different flocks in Monarda. The uh, powdery mildew that goes to Zinnia is one that we have found very useful for doing studies. Uh, this is Golovinomyces chicorii. And the one that we, the Zinnia that we use for our studies is one called Magellan Orange. You should always see what I'm using for my studies and realize that it's prone to the disease. This would not be an easy one to produce in an area where you had uh, weeds growing outside supplying inoculum, for example. Um, this is from a trial that we did this year to give you a sense for how chemical control can work with powdery mildew. Uh, here you can see that the blue line on top is the progression of the disease uh, when you have no chemicals applied whatsoever. Powdery mildew just increases on plants. You're looking here at the number of leaves that are affected by the disease. And what we found at the beginning of this trial, which um, had its first spray on the 3rd of September and its first inoculation, on the 4th of September was that as long as we used our test chemicals at a weekly interval, um, they were all effective against the disease. So nothing was happening except in the controls. So we got bored and quit spraying them to see what would happen. So on the 23rd of September, we ceased spraying and looked to see how long the controls would last. And it was interesting to see how they separated out towards the uh, latter weeks of the trial. Uh, we had one material that was one of the combination 11 plus three materials that um, just kept working all the way through and would obviously be something that you might be able to use at a monthly interval effectively. Um, the other materials we tested were only keeping tight control of the disease if you were treating probably more like a two week interval. And this is the kind of thing that um, the companies need to understand in order to set their label information so that you can work with the products appropriately and know how far you can go between applications. Powdery mildew works very quickly, so it's not a disease where I would suggest that you stretch the interval uh, recommended on a label. Here's the list of different kinds of materials that might be used against powdery mildew. It's a big list. That's the only point I wanted to make with this slide, um, other than to show you that we do think in terms of frac groups when we think about controlling a powdery mildew disease, because it is one that is prone to resistance development against chemistries. So when it says group 11 on that first line, for example, that is the group of strobilurin fungicides that are all going to act the same way. So you don't ever want to be trying to rotate within the same group. You need to get out of 11 to do your next treatment. Uh, labels of these products are going to, to help you with some of this, uh, but you need to have an innate understanding of, of what a frac group is. Um, you have here both group 11, then you have some of the combination products that have been coming on the market in recent years that are group seven plus group 11. Uh, you have some group three materials, a new group 50 material. Um, and then after that, the materials are all not such um, precise acting systemic. So they have um, different kinds of grouping, things like NC, which says non-classified, for example, or groups that, um, start with an M or contact action materials like the coppers. Uh, so let's break that down a little bit and look at the groups. Here are your main systemic groups that would be used against powdery mildews. Um, the first one there is the, the strobilurin group, group 11, um, both the straight products and those that are combined with group seven materials. Uh, then there's an older group of DMIs, um, which includes things like TerraGuard and Eagle, um, Banner Max can only be used outdoors, don't use that one in the greenhouse. And then a new one called Cyto that is a group 50 material. So you could work in rotation between these products um, or you could also alternate them with some of these other kinds of materials that are available. Um, your resistance management is especially needed with these group three, group 11, group seven materials and also with the older um, frac group one uh, which was the first to develop incredible resistance, the one that uh, where thiophenate methyl belongs. When you're working with those, you can work uh, rotating between them. 
And you can also work with these kinds of materials that are all effective against powdery mildew. So I would suggest that you think about which of the systemics you might want to work with and then slip in some of these contact materials in between them uh, so that you can obey the, the label precautions about not overuse um, and so that you can get the benefit of their kinds of action, um, the biological controls or the botanicals or the contact action materials are a good thing to add to your powdery mildew program when you have a powdery mildew prone host. So that's what I have to explain to you today about powdery mildews. I would like to acknowledge again, the sponsors of this program, helping to give you some education about powdery mildew disease. And if you would like to register for additional grow pro sessions, uh, the website is provided here endowment.org slash grow pro. And hopefully you can join us again for more sessions in 2022. And now I would be delighted to take some questions from you on the topic of powdery mildew and its management. Thank you so much, Marjorie, for your presentation. That was extremely informative. I hope my sound is better now. <laughs> uh, I just changed the setting. Uh, so please make sure to submit your questions into the Q&A. Uh, to, through the Q&A feature or through the chat, since we have Marjorie here to answer our questions. Uh, while people do that, I would like to start with a question. So what do you think is the worst disease in, the green, in greenhouses, downy mildew or powdery mildew? Well, that's a funny one, Lane, or you sound great, by the way. Um, I, I would say that um, you're actually in trouble in either case, um, but, if I had to pick, I'd probably say that downy mildew was uh, worse in the sense that it's more um, out of the blue. It tends to pounce without as much warning when the weather has shifted to provide a moisture, wetter situation. It can just appear out of nowhere. Uh, with the powdery mildews, you often get a little bit of warning. It starts out small and then it builds up and it can build up to a frightful epidemic, but Usually, you're, you know that your crop is prone to it, you've planned in advance, you've got controls in place, so it can be more of a business as usual type of disease, and I think that's easier for a grower to cope with. So I guess in that sense, I would, I would prefer to deal with the powdery mildew because you can actually anticipate a bit. Yeah. Talking about a little bit about control, you mentioned that the resistance can be built from powdery mildew. Uh, so my question is, can you control powdery mildew just with bio biologicals or just with contact? Uh, one of the, uh, the chemicals that you said that were just contact, not like systemic. Mm -hmm. um, I get that question a lot because many of the folks are growing crops that are edible, that have a list about this long that, um, of chemicals that they're allowed to use. And um, I find that they are able to manage the disease they just have to work hard at it. Um, the biologicals are effective, but they're not effective in as magical a way. So for example, they don't have a long period of control. You're likely to only get control for one week uh, with one of the biologicals. Um, it works nicely to, for example, alternate that with a, something like a mill stop where you've got a, a chemical action, but one that's allowed in organic programs. Um, or an oil that might be allowed in organic programs. Mm -hmm. So if you work with those few ingredients that have some power to them, um, you can have good management, but you also have to manage your environment because powdery mildew is completely controlled by the humidity um, and whether the, the air in the greenhouse is stagnant, you don't want to have any corners that have no air movement in them. So if you can have good environmental management and use biological controls primarily uh, that you've tested and found to have some efficacy. And you can, you can have a program that's, that's good. You just can't walk away from it and expect it to work for an extra week, for example. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Tied with that, we've got a question in the chat that says, uh, any suggestions on using a climate to prevent mildew and can you strictly use climate to keep it in control? Okay. So it's kind of tied with what you just said. It does, it ties right in with it. And um, I'm not someone who has fancy chemical, um, excuse me, fancy computer controls in my own greenhouse. Uh, so I haven't been able to experiment with this myself, 
but I certainly have been to visit operations where they are able to do an exquisite job of managing the relative humidity, anticipating changes in um, what will happen when the sun goes behind a cloud. Um, if you have a sophisticated enough system with the right thinking behind it, um, yes, that can be a very important way for managing powdery mildew. I'd probably want something else there also as insurance, but that can do the bulk of the job for you. Um, it is very, very much regulated by whether the environment is fostering the disease. And it proceeds much more quickly when you have the perfect relative humidity and the perfect temperature. But sometimes the perfect humidity and the perfect temperature for the powdery mildew is also the perfect relative humidity and perfect temperature for the crop. So um, it's, it's certainly something to aspire to if you've got good environmental management tools I would use them to get as far as you can away from perfect conditions for a powdery mildew. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got another question uh, that says, what other plant species are known to be host for the powdery mildew that infect hemp? Ah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's, it's an interesting one. Um, the main thing I would suspect, um, and to the point of knowing is that, um, Hops is an extremely close crop. So uh, if I were growing a crop of hemp, I would certainly be um, not wanting a hops crop growing right next door uh, because it could be a source of organisms that were able to affect both of those plants. They're just very close relatives. So that, that would be the, the first thing I would think of. And I don't know beyond that, you'd have to go item by item, uh, mildew by mildew, downy mildew, powdery mildew, and see what the rest of the host range might be. Um, and of course, we, we haven't really been doing much academic research on uh, cannabis over the years. So we, we're catching up in terms of learning things like the extremities of host range for the different things that can attack hemp. Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so coming back to the uh, weather question of the environment, uh, you will say that you will see more powder mildew diseases in the greenhouse in the winter? Well, we're just coming into winter and um, there aren't very many powdery mildew diseases showing this year. Uh, certainly uh, a reason for that is that we're not seeing it in, powder, in the uh, poinsettia crop this year, which is terrific. Every once in a while it slips into the poinsettias and it would be going gangbusters now if it were there. Um, but it does not seem to have been a problem for this growing season. And I hope I'm right in speaking for the whole country. I certainly haven't seen it in the Northeast. Um, the thing which makes the winter not particularly bad for powdery mildew is that it's the heating season. So the very action of heating the greenhouse and then ventilating really drives the wet air out of the greenhouse and gives us management potential so that we can keep powdery mildews down. They don't like that dry air. So I don't think of the winter as being particularly the time for powdery mildews. And I don't think of the middle of the summer as the time for powdery mildews either. All of them have a high temperature cutoff. And when it gets into the high 90s, it's really not good for most of the powdery mildew diseases. So I think of the powdery mildew diseases as being more transition weather diseases in the fall before you really get the heating going in here in the Northeast, for example or in the spring uh, when mm -hmm. you're quitting your heating, uh, anything that makes it more difficult to anticipate your humidity situation is going to increase powdery mildew. Um, when you can just sort of set it to the heat every day and dry the air down, uh, then you've got control over powdery mildew. And when you get surprises, um, wet days, changes in light, changes in um, humidity because of rainfall and what have you, um, that's, that's when you've got a really dangerous time to manage. So I, I think fall and spring are the best powdery mildew seasons if you're thinking like a powdery mildew. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, we've got another question that says, has powdery and downy mildew mutated more in the past few seasons? Has it mutated more? Yes. Ah, interesting. Um, I don't know that they have. Um, one of the things that I have noticed over the years is that sometimes we have entire seasons where we don't see as much powdery mildew out of doors. And actually, I would say that was true of this past year here where I live. 
and I have attributed that largely to things like more frequent rainfall, because in the natural world, when you have more rainfall, you have more of the parasites of the parasite active. So you can have some of the, what we would think of as beneficial fungi uh, from our perspective, um, you have them enjoying that greater leaf wetness and therefore able to attack the powdery mildew and keep it in check. And um, so I have seen weather patterns have a real effect out of doors in terms of actual changes in the mildews I don't really have a way of, of monitoring them. I think we're just getting into the era of being able to use our molecular techniques to see whether things change in ways that are significant um, over short periods of time. And now that we have the tools to measure that kind of thing, I think we're gonna find out there is a lot of change. Um, there's also a possible tie-in to overall weather trends as we get into um, perhaps more of a warming trend. We're going to be probably favoring certain of the downy mildews and certain of the powdery mildews because some of them like a warmer temperature. And depending on which crop you grow, that might seem like there's been a great change, but perhaps it's only relevant to that particular organism. So um, as we go along, we'll learn more about these kinds of things. It's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, we've got another question that said, have you heard of any instance of powdery mildew being transmitted by seed? Probably not in the seed, but perhaps, but perhaps on the surface. Um, interesting question. I think it's conceivable, but um, it would just require that the seed not be treated in any way. So often we're paying extra for seed that's been washed and, and scrubbed and, and presented to you in really clean form. Uh, if not, you know, acid dipped, for example. So if you have a seed that's pretty much rough, um, it can have particles of plant tissue sticking to it. Uh, it could have Cleistothesia on it conceivably uh, in some instances. So there could be um, a little tiny chance of some movement of powdery mildews on seed. But for the most part, it's not going to happen that way. So if I see powdery mildew on young plants in the greenhouse, I would look to see what other crops might have powdery mildew and whether they might have that powdery mildew fungus in common. And I would also look under the bench and see if there are weeds in the greenhouse or weeds outside the vents, because uh, particularly if it's a composite plant, there could easily be a composite weed nearby that could be supplying the powdery mildew. Dandelions might be your problem, for example. So um, I would consider that the last possibility, just not an impossibility. Yeah. Wow. Great question. Uh, I have another question that you said that it was like the symptoms of the powdery mildew change between species. Mm -hmm. So if I see whitish areas on a leaf, but none of the sugary coating on, uh, on, on those spots, can this be powdery mildew? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good question. On some plants, the fungus hardly seems to want to make spores. Um, so it's perfectly possible for there to be a very flat kind of infection that doesn't look sugary. Um, some of the powdery mildews um, are sort of struggling. They may not be very happy with that particular plant host. Maybe it's not a cultivar they like or what have you. So they're able to grow on the plant. They just aren't getting the right chemistries or what have you to, to be able to sporulate well. So if you see an area that that has some sort of a little spot to it, look at it under a microscope if you have access to one and see if you see the strands growing across the surface because that's really the only way you're going to be able to tell. And don't get fooled by leaf hairs. There's lots of interesting things on the surface of plant uh, tissue. Um, so look carefully, magnify it enough so that you can see what's happening. And often you'll find you know, one or two little conidia fours and, and a few little chains of conidia there. Uh, to help you be sure that you have actually a powdery mildew. But it, it can be tricky to identify. I think um, I tried to really stress a lot of the things that can fool you because I see them a lot uh, because growers don't know what's happening when they see that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's complicated to identify. Mm -hmm. And I have one last question if nobody else has more questions. Uh, you mentioned a lot of resistance uh, cultivars. Are they 
like do you have like a place where you publish all these lists of <laughs> cultivars by by species or is there anything like a compendium like a book that you can review every year um i wish there were um I feel guilty every time I tell people to use resistant varieties and then I can't hand them a, a Bible that lists them all. Um, it's a changing story. That's one of the things that makes it very hard. Um, so often when I work with a plant, the next year I get it and it, it's no longer susceptible to mildew because the plant breeders have figured out that they need to improve it. And so it can have a very similar name and actually be better than it was the year before. So um, it's, it's dangerous to try to make a list that's a forever list because mm -hmm. it's just going to change on you. And the fungi themselves can change too. Uh, someone mentioned mutations. Well, yeah, there are mutations and they're different regions of the country. So there might be a, um, and in fact, there was um, a case where there was a powdery mildew that was prevalent on verbena in California and plant breeders tried to develop the verbena so that it was not susceptible to that powdery mildew. And they did a great job. But then when the plants were brought to the Northeast, uh, they encountered a different powdery mildew that verbena was susceptible to. Uh, they had not been selected for that resistance. So there was a lot of trouble and that's gotten better now. Uh, we see a much easier time in greenhouses growing verbena because there are many fewer cultivars that are susceptible to that disease. So um, we just, I think, have to give feedback to the industry. When you think mm -hmm. you're noticing a problem like this on a particular plant, uh, let your salesperson know, let the company know through them. Make sure you're not just swallowing it because the information is needed so that people can improve the plant quality for the next season. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, sharing information should be great so yeah. everybody can know mm -hmm. what is happening. So if there is no more questions, I would like to Thank you, Marjorie, for your time and for joining us uh, today. I want to thank everybody that uh, joined us today for the last session of the 2021 AFE Grow Pro webinar series. But this is not the end of the webinar series. Our 22 calendar of Grow Pro webinars will be released in the following weeks at endowment.org slash growpro. While you're there, check out our past webinar recordings other grower-related resources and research reports available to you free, thanks to, thanks to industry support. We ask you to please complete the brief survey uh, about today's session. Your feedback will help us continue to improve the monthly webinars and provide additional topics of, import of importance. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a, a great day. Bye.